Hello everyone, uh, I'm Kathleen Newman, Manager of Education and Public Programs, coming to you from Maine Historical Society and the childhood home of the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow on September 10th, 2020. Uh, joining us for our program this evening is Nick Fassbains, author of uh, Cross of Snow. Uh, and with us also this evening is our Visitor Services Manager, John Babin. I want to introduce our speakers properly uh, and just remind everyone, uh, again, this program is being recorded. So if uh, you'd like to come back and revisit it later, you may, or if you know someone that couldn't attend live, you can share it with them later via Maine Historical Society's website. If you have questions for our speakers, feel free to type those into the chat or into the Q&A feature. Um, you should see both those icons at the bottom of your screen. Um, also feel free if you'd like to say hello and tell us where you're tuning in from, uh, please type that into the chat as well. So Nicholas Fassbains, uh, he was, was born in Lowell, Massachusetts. He is an award-winning investigative journalist uh, and the former literary editor of the Worcester Sunday Telegram. And his articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Smithsonian. He's offered 10 different books, including A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomains, and The Eternal Passion for Books, and On Paper, the everything of its 2000 year history. He lives in North Grafton, Massachusetts, and his latest publication, Cross of Snow, A Life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, is the subject of our program tonight. And also with us tonight is John Babin, who is a Portland, Maine native and the Visitor Services Manager here at Maine Historical Society. He's previously served as the site coordinator and as a guide at the Wadsworth Longfellow House here at MHS. And he is the author of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Portland, the Fireside Poet of Maine. So thank you gentlemen both uh, for joining us here uh, this evening. I'm going to turn it over to you. Nick's going to uh, talk to us about his book and uh, the two of you are going to talk a little uh, Henry history for us this evening. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you so much for inviting me to join all the good people in Maine and from other places who are here with us tonight. And it's great to see you again, John. The last time you and I got together, uh, you showed my wife and myself through that magnificent house on Congress Street, which is such an important place in my new book, Across, Across of Snow. And it was a second or a third trip for me through there, but I have to say in your company, it really, it, which, which is one of the most remarkable things about place when you're a writer and you're looking to really enliven uh, a narrative to see not only a, a physical location, but, but the things, the, the, the furnishings, the artworks, the, the, uh, the various little uh, knickknacks that, that might just seem like or, uh, ornaments to so many people or decorations, but in fact really were key and, and played a role in the formation of, of the poet as a young man and, and the man he became and the great poet who uh, earned an international reputation. I'm so looking forward to discussing with you. You are the authority on uh, Henry and uh, Portland, Maine. And, and in fact, I used your book as a wonderful source. I cited and I was very thrilled to have it as a resource and really especially delighted to, to be having this conversation with you tonight. And briefly, if I may, <clears throat> I realize it could be interpreted as a plug, but here is the, here is the, here is the cover of my new book, Cross of Snow. And I, I, I'm showing it not only to show you the book, but also to kind of uh, pay, uh, focus on the photograph that, that appears on the cover. I love it because it is the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow that was known and beloved by millions of readers around the world. It was taken in 1868, seven years after the death of his second beloved wife, uh, Fanny Appleton Longfellow. We'll discuss the, the uh, determinations of all that uh, through the course of the conversation, but he, he had, was making what amounts to a victory tour of Europe. He was traveling with members of his family. He was received at Windsor Castle by Queen uh, Victoria. On the same day that he spent uh, time with Charles Dickens, he went to the Isle of Wight and he visited with the poet laureate, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who by the way, Henry outsold in England on his own turf. This is how popular he was, celebrated. And during that trip to Windsor Castle, Queen Victoria remarked later that night in her diary how astonished she was at all the domestic help, the servants, that to use an unpopular, out of fashion word, but the, the domestic staff were taking up vantage points to get a glimpse 
of this famous man, this poet. She was astonished that a poet, an American poet, should be so well known by the staff. And it turned out they all knew his work, as everyone in England did. Well, when he went to visit with Tennyson, Tennyson brought him over to the studio of J Julia Cameron, the great, great uh, photo portraitist. And she took that magnificent photograph, a kind of almost iconic photograph uh, that uh, I love it because it really is the Longfellow known and beloved by the world. It was kind of the image that would be used to uh, uh, be the basis of a bust that was installed in Westminster Abbey <clears throat> after his death. He's the only American to date to be so honored with a full bust in Westminster Abbey. He was without question the most popular, the most celebrated uh, poet, writer, in, in the English-speaking world, with, along with Charles Dickens, who uh, he and Dickens became very good friends. And so with, really, when, he, when we look at him there in that picture, we're seeing the Henry Knoll uh, after the death of both of his wives. He had two wonderful wives, two women who he loved dearly, both of whom died tragically. Uh, and, uh, but that's the, that's the Longfellow known to the world. The Longfellow known to the people of Maine as he was growing up was a very uh, clean-shaven, handsome young man, uh, loved to wear beautiful clothes, brilliant. He attended Bowdoin, Bowdoin College. He entered it as a, as a, as a 15-year-old freshman, spent his freshman year at home in Brun Brunswick with his brother. They were tutored at home. And then for their sophomore year, they moved into, <clears throat> into, the, into, the, into uh, college quarters. Henry graduated at the age of 18. And on, on his commencement day, very close to there too, he was, he was, made this, he was given the stupendous offer of becoming a full professor at Bowdoin College at the age of 18 and, and to be a professor of a newly established seat uh, uh, chair in the teaching of modern European languages. Only three other colleges in the United States did that at that time, Harvard, William and Mary, University of Virginia. It was a bequest given to the college by the widow of James Bowdoin, the founder of the college to establish such a chair. The only problem is he had to go to Europe and learn these languages that he would be required to teach. And this trip he makes abroad, he leaves when he's 19. He graduates in 1825 at the age of 18, and he travels, and he, he spends three years. This is an unaccompanied teenager in 1826. 1825, 1826 is when he leaves, and he's there through 1829. And he lives in Madrid, and he lives in Rome, and he lives in Paris, and he goes to Germany. He picks up eight or nine or 10 languages along the way, and he falls in love uh, we, there's not a, lot, a great deal of documentary material to, to uh, document this, but it's, it's sufficient to, to, to uh, show that he really came alive in many, many fundamental ways. I call that chapter Awakening. That's that chapter where he leaves for Europe at the age of 19 and he learns languages. He becomes a, a young man. He becomes an adult. And when he returns to Bowdoin College to take up his position <clears throat> where he will remain for seven years, and really the course, the course of his life has been established. He translates, not only does he teach languages, not only does he learn languages in Europe, he learned literature as foreign literature, as you can argue that Longfellow is perhaps our first multiculturalist years before that phrase is even established. He introduces languages, he introduces literatures, and he falls in love with a Portland woman, a neighbor, a daughter of a neighbor from Portland, Mary Stora Potter. And they, are, they get married and they have, a, they have a life in Brunswick. But Henry, having visited the great capitals of, the, of Europe and uh, uh, moved over in very uh, high, high uh, circles, he became friendly with the, the diplomatic circle in Madrid. He got to know Washington Irving. And he moved in very, among very interesting people. He really longed to, as he says in his journal, uh, perform on a larger stage. And he really, as much as he loves teaching at Bowdoin and he loves the state of Maine, he yearns uh, to go onto a larger stage. And uh, seven years later, he gets this stupendous opportunity to uh, take up a similar position at Harvard College. And he leaves for Europe with his young wife. Tragically, I'm really summarizing it here, Mary dies. Uh, she's pregnant. We don't really know that until the day of her, she has her miscarriage and uh, it's reported to the family at home and she, she dies 54 uh, days or so later. Henry is absolutely grief stricken. He is uh, devastated, yet he soldiers on and he learns more languages. He's really intent on learning German. He takes a break. He goes off on a, on a sojourn of several weeks and he meets quite by serendipity, 
the woman who will become his second wife, Frances Elizabeth Appleton Longfellow. Now, the title of my book, Cross of Snow, I'll briefly tell you, is, is from a sonnet that Henry writes 18 years to the day after the death of Fanny, who dies quite horrifically in a domestic accident that changes, that turns an idyllic life upside down. What was then a perfect uh, uh, relationship, it turns into a moment of great devastation. And Henry, who had suffered great grief after the loss of his first wife, <clears throat> now has a similar, only a greater uh, loss. Now they have five children, five young children. He's this world uh, famous poet, but uh, as he says, uh, to the outside world, I project harm inwardly, I'm bleeding to death. And yet he soldiers on for the good of his children. He becomes this poet who we see, and that's when he grows the beard because Fanny dies in a fire. That is a domestic fire that starts while she's sealing some, some lockets of hair that she's clipped for one of her uh, daughters and she's sealing it with a candle and it's a horrible, it's a horrible catastrophe. And Henry tries futilely to put out the flames and he, he suffers burns, which is the reason he, he, he grows this beard. Meanwhile, he comes back and he, uh, he uh, soldiers on and he, his, his celebrity even becomes greater. But we look back at these years in Maine uh, what is really it's significant in my book, and I really am so grateful that I had not only the house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the uh, Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site, but I also had the Wadsworth Longfellow House in Maine. I think Longfellow is unique, and I use that word knowingly. As a writer, unique is one of a kind. Now, if somebody can point out another example, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. But name me another writer who has two of his residences, two of his domiciles, not one, not two, are national historic sites. And not only are houses where he lived and where he worked, but where he, where he loved, where he raised children, where he, inter, where he uh, uh, connected with his family. Uh, we have the one in the house in Maine and we have the house in Cambridge. And they're both magnificent. They've been restored to their uh, original uh, uh, furnishings. Uh, they have their original furnishings. Not only do we have these houses, we have their contents. And, and many, in both cases, we have documents and I really uh, I drew hungrily from these, from these resources while writing my book. But the years in Maine were so, so important. Not only the fact that his father was a prominent judge who preached to, uh, decency. Henry was easily one of the most decent people I've, I've ever met in, in, in research. And I think one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book about him, I mean, there have been other books, good books written about him, but not uh, one that really focused on, on the domestic life to the extent that I have. I think this is the first book to really profile not only Henry, but, but the relationship with Fanny Appleton Longfellow, who you will see is not only the great love of his life after the loss of his loved first wife, Mary, but also this intellectual partner who worked with him, who counseled him, read everything that he wrote, who may even have given him some ideas for some of his poems. He's certainly know of a few that she, that she worked on. Uh, Mary, we know less about, but I was determined, I was determined not only to write about Fanny at great length, but I really had to write about Mary. And I have to say, I, I used everything I could find about Mary. That, that, that chapter three, uh, I, I, I devote really not just to Mary, but his life with Mary. It begins with Mary after her uh, uh, miscarriage and the final days of her life, Henry's grief stricken response and how he moves on to, to find and move on to this next phase of his life. After his second wife dies, he writes in his journal, Act Two of Life's Rama has now ended. Act One was his life with Mary and his, the time in Maine. Act Two was his life with Fanny in Cambridge. And now Act Three was the remaining 21 or 22 years of his life. So that's it in kind of a, a brief summary. The Cross of Snow, as I said, gets its title from a sonnet that Henry wrote towards the end of his life. <clears throat> On the 18th anniversary of Fanny's death, they had been married for 18 years. And he contemplates a painting uh, in the bedroom, the master bedroom of his house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a painting of Fanny. And it's, it's, it's a very private, personal painting because it's in the master bedroom. And really, it's a picture that only he uh, contemplates. And then that's the first uh, eight lines of the poem. And the final six lines of the poem uh, takes into account this massive uh, painting, uh, Thomas Moran's painting of the Mountain of the Holy Cross, recently discovered in Colorado with a massive cross of snow on its side, uh, the image of a cross of snow in the crevices. And he, he describes in that sonnet, such is the, uh, 
the pain, the, the, such as the cross I bear upon my chest these 18 years, changeless since the day she died. He's comparing the magnitude of his grief to this massive mountain in the distant west. It was such a personal poem. He tucked it. He didn't, it wasn't published. He put it in an envelope. It was discovered after his death, published posthumously. I have to say, when I was going through the documents at Houghton Library at Harvard University and came across it in the archives, it's one of these things where you have to, it's the original holographic manuscript and you're looking at it. And I use it as a, uh, as an, as a frontispiece portrait in this, uh, in this book, the, the holographic copy of that sonnet. It, it, it stops you in your tracks. You have to just sit back and say, wow, this is, this is something special. You're, you're holding in your hands this poem that was so easily the most personal poem that he, that he had ever, I think, written. And a few others also, he, he named them published not so commonly he did when he was in, uh, in uh, Germany in 1842, which we're going to talk about with John. So that's uh, my brief summary in a nutshell. And I'm going to uh, bring in John at this point, because I think really we'd like to talk, talk a bit about Henry and Maine and the house and your work there and your, your, the wonderful book that you've written, not only about Henry, but about, but about the house and the composition of these poems and what Maine meant to him throughout the, the creation of his really extraordinary oeuvre of work. So John, I want to turn it over to you at this point. Hey Nick, great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. I really, um, really, really love the book. Your research is incredible. And I just want to congratulate you. It's really, really a great, great work. Um, my job here at the Maine Historical Society, not only is managing the house, but basically telling the story of Henry's life here in Portland and his life in Maine. And um, I, I always start out by telling people what a great, great childhood the poet had in that home. Um, he actually had parents that were just loving and nurturing. His mother, Zilpa, was a very, very, very great writer, number one, but encouraged him to write. So he really had, you know, a great, great background, you know, with his parents encouraging him. And, you know, they, they were they were fun kids. They they really enjoyed their life. Ann talks about when they would do their homework and after they would get done, you know, they would run out to the kitchen and they would play. And that's where you would hear shouts of joy and glee coming from the Longfellow children. And one of the things I always tell people about is they, they had a little saying and that this saying was one that they would recite when people would ask them their name, and this would be in the order of their birth. It would be Stephen and Henry, Elizabeth and Anne, Alex and Mary, Ellen and Sam. Okay, so that was basically, and then the, one of the great stories that Longfellow talks about was their childhood growing up in Thanksgiving, what a great, great, feast and what a holiday it was. And they really celebrated that more than Christmas. And Henry's story is sitting on the breakfast stairwell of the stairwell that goes into the kitchen from the second floor. The boys would sit there as the, the help and the mother sometime and the sisters were out cooking all these beautiful things. And Henry said him and his brothers would just sit on the rungs of the stairs and smell that beautiful aroma coming from the kitchen. So this just just so many, many stories um, that, that we can go on about um, how his life was so great here in Portland. But the biggest story is when we end the tour, we tell the story about the sister Anne, who left the home to the Maine Historical Society. She died in 1901, but six years prior to that, she got together with Maine Historical Society and she left the home in all its contents. And along with that is eight pages of instruction saying certain things are not to be touched and certain things are not to be moved. And when I brought you through the house and told you those stories about, you know, the oldest piece dating back to 1760 and what they call the new table, it's back to 1835. So it's just, it's, it's great, great stories. Henry's bedroom on the third floor looking out. Um, Oh, to the Portland headlight, writing the poem about the headlight, the light called the lighthouse. Um, one of his early poems um, called Musings that he writes about looking out, out into the harbor over the roofs of the city. Um, so I, I really love a lot of his early poetry and um, the, the cover that you have, that iconic picture of him, um, I always show that and then I automatically show a small picture of Henry's young child and I said, this is how he was remembered. Yeah, this is. Yeah, 
and especially that his room on the third floor, uh, all the kids, they, that, that floor was added. Uh, the, the, we should point out that the house was built by Henry's maternal grandfather, Peely Wadsworth, who was a Revolutionary War hero and who uh, commanded a detachment during the revolution in the district of Maine. And Henry really looked up to Peely. In fact, I went out to the house. They built a, Peely built a homestead out in Hiram, Maine. He was, in recognition of his service in the revolution, they gave him 7,500 acres of land about 40 miles west of Portland. And they built a home there that is still in the family. It's a, it's a national historic designated site, but it's still privately owned and occupied. And my wife and I got permission to go and view it because Henry spent a lot of time there with Peleg and with his and his uh, parents and his and they heard these wonderful stories, these wonderful stories from his grandfather talking about the revolution and these old tales of the Native Americans, the Indians. They gave him really fired his imagination. And I love that you mentioned those early poems that he wrote, "My Lost Youth," which I think is a fabulous poem. He wrote that in 1855, and he's talking about growing up in Maine and he. And I, I, I begin the book, actually the very first chapter with a, uh, two excerpts uh, from his diary where he says, I had an idea for a poem last night, it was 1855, and it's about my, my youth in Maine, and he called it my lost youth, and he uses this old Lapland line, again, something he learned while he was traveling in Europe, and uh, uh, the winds will, the boys will is the winds will, and the, and the trails of youth are long, long, I can't do it directly from memory, but it's a refrain that runs directly through a magnificent poem. And he talks in that poem about memories. And I asked you about this. I, I think maybe I'd love to hear you tell us a little bit about it, because when he was six years old, and he remembers the, the, the cannonade out in the, off Monhegan Island, and he's, during the War of 1812, I guess it was, it was 1813, and the, the Boxer and the Enterprise squared off in a, a battle, a, a, a sea battle between two uh, mighty ships of the line, and you could hear this this cannonade rumbling all over the all over the area of the, the, the Portland Peninsula. And he remembered it. He remembered the, the battle. Uh, I quote the, the two stanzas in the poem. And it, what was really remarkable about that battle is the skippers of both ships, the British and the American skipper, both were killed. They both were killed. The, the Americans won. They took the they took the, uh, the boxer as a prize of war. They towed it into Portland, and they had one of the most remarkable events, I think, anywhere is that the, the, British, the British sailors and the American sailors, they marched in a parade to the cemetery right there in Portland, marched, I think, close to the house on Congress Street. I think I asked him, did they go by the house? He said, well, we really don't know, but it was close enough that he remembers it. But they marched together and they, and they buried these two skippers side by side in Eastern Cemetery. I think they're still there. And Henry just remembers that, and where, they, where he heard that sound. And it's, I think it just fired his imagination of exotic places of sailing. He noted the, the sailors from foreign lands walking down the street, just inspired his, his imagination of exotic places. Because Portland was quite a, quite a sophisticated sea town. I mean, it had a lot of traffic, a lot of sea traffic coming in. I think it kind of gave him some, some, uh, some thoughts some dreams of travel in foreign places. But uh, you told me about that, that wonderful story. I just loved it. And again, he, how he, Pulled, pulled on these, pulled from these experiences of his youth. He remembered from six years old that scene and used it as a central image in that poem. I loved it. I remember the sea fight far away, how it thundered o'er the tide, oh. and the dead captains as they lay in their grave, or looking the tranquil bay, where in battle they died. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was wonderful. wonderful. And I guess I should look up the history of that, and it's, it's an amazing history. You never. You know, I haven't been there. I, I believe that those those two uh, tombs are still there, right? Side by side, the two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Skippers. I think they were above ground and they faced the water. It was, uh, and it's also in that cemetery where Peleg Wadsworth entered, uh, erected a cenotaph, a stone, because he lost his son, Henry Wadsworth, Lieutenant Henry Wadsworth, 22 years old, in the Battle of Tripoli Harbor in 1805, I think it is, whatever it is, 1805. 1805. And uh, by the way, the, the memorial in Washington, D.C., which was later moved to Annapolis, uh, honoring the dead, the dead American sailors, uh, officers on the ship, there were 13 of them, is the first war memorial in the United States. It was erected in 1806. The uh, marble was brought from uh, Carrera Marble, was brought to America on the USS Constitution. But it was this heroic 
uh, action of his, of his mother's brother, Harry, they called him, but he, but he was Henry Wadsworth, and he died heroically in a, it was a, it was a mission gone awry. It was a torpedo boat who flew up in Tripoli Harbor, and it was horrible. And his body was never recovered. And in your main historical society, I found a notice, a death notice that Zilpha wrote. She was a wonderful writer. Thank you for pointing that out. Because Henry's relationship with his mother, I argue, is the first of many, many meaningful intellectual relationships that he has with women throughout his life. When he's a young 16-year-old at Bowdoin College, and he's supposed to be watching his older brother, Stephen, who has wayward uh, ways. He, he is uh, sent home on a rustication at one point uh, because of the, he was uh, uh, bringing in uh, spirituous liquors to the college, and he was hanging around in Ward's Tavern. And he had a pretty good time. Nathaniel Hawthorne knew his brother Stephen better than he knew Henry, his Bowdoin undergraduates. But uh, Henry was supposed to watch over his brother. He's the younger brother, but he's watching over his brother Stephen. And in the same letters that he's reporting to his mother about Stephen, they're having this conversation about poetry, about Thomas, and she's, she's questioning him. She's probing him on Gray's Elegy in the country courtyard. He's talking about sublimity and all these other factors that she wants. She likes poetry that's a little clearer, a little more forthright. I just, these letters, a 16-year-old kid sharing, exchanging with his mother on literary matters, they're wonderful. And you see this throughout his life, these relationships, these intellectual relationships that he has with, with, with the women in his life, most notably his two wives, but other people like Julia Ward Howe, uh, Annie Adams Field, you'll find that there's always this really a, 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 a high level give and take, an intellectual give and take, and he respects women. Uh, he give, in one of his lectures at, Bowdoin, at, at uh, Harvard College on Dante, he remarks about Dante, he said, you can, you can look through all of Dante, you will not find one disparaging comment that he ever made about a woman. Of course, Henry will become the first translator of Dante into English by an American after the death of Fanny. But I say that as what he says about Dante, you can also apply to Henry. You can really see this, this respect, not only respect, but this respect for, for women as thinkers. And that's one of the reasons why this relationship with Fanny was so very, very special. His first wife, we can't really judge that much. She died so young. But I, thought, I find it very, very interesting also that among her personal possessions that are at the Longfellow House in Cambridge are books. He, he couldn't bear to see things that reminded of her. He writes a letter to one of the sisters, sending all her personal possessions home up to Maine. And even a, full, a painting that he, he, he couldn't bear to look at. But he says, just the slightest thing makes me think of Mary. But what he did keep were for a number of her books, inscribed by her books that were important. And if you, if you go through the Longfellow House in Cambridge, you'll see very few traces of Mary, but you will find these four books. Having you know, 12,000 books there, so there are four or so in the collection. But uh, and these are all the Longfellow's books, so it's a remarkable place. And you have original books in the Portland House, I think, too, don't you? Uh, yes, there's a number of original books, and um, also um, the ones that he gave to Anne um, that are in the, that, that are in the library, and also um, Anne saved a lot of the books um, of her husband, George Washington Pierce. Um, she was only married to George for three years and lost him to typhus, and that's when she moved back into the home, living there 87 of the 90 years that she was alive. Um, and those books are up in her bedroom, so um, she started to actually catalog those. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned Pierce, because <clears throat> he was also one of Henry's best friends at Bowdoin. They were undergraduates together at Bowdoin College, uh, Pierce, he and George Washington Pierce, and then he married his sister. And when Mary dies in Europe, she dies in Holland, Pierce dies of typhus at just about the same time. Within a couple of weeks of each other, he gets it in the letter. So he, this is a double blow. I mean, his wife, his, uh, his wife has just died and his sister has just lost her. Her husband was also one of his great friends. And Anne was a very young woman. I don't know how old she was when she became a widow. But as you point out, she went back to the family homestead and lived there for the next 60 years. And to that circumstance is one of the reasons we have the house, as you pointed out, coming not only to the Maine Historical Society as this remarkable house, but all the contents are original to the family. Now, how often does that happen? You find like Melville's house out in Western Mass, well, it changed owners, uh, you know, so things that are in there, were, very few things belong to Melville. But when you see the, your, the, how the Wadsworth, the Longfellow House in Portland and the Longfellow House in Cambridge, these are furnishings and paintings 
and things that were that were special and personal to the to the occupants. You mentioned earlier t uh, a conversation that I think your favorite piece in the Portland house is a desk, right? The one that he wrote the rainy day on, is, 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 or is it the lap desk that he took with him to, to Europe? I think you could tell me a little bit about that because I love that. Well, one of the desks that he wrote on was actually um, the one that I talked about, the rainy day desk that Ann refers to. And that desk was in the family um, since the 1700s. That's a very, very old desk that actually belonged to Zilpa's sister. And when Zilpa's sister died, she left the desk to um, her other sister, Lucia. Um, and then the desk actually, that desk actually has moved around in the home. Um, it, it was not always in the summer dining room. It was actually up on the second floor at one time. It actually um, went to Massachusetts for a while um, on loan and then was brought back to the home. Um, so I'm not sure when it came back to the home, but um, I think it left after he wrote The Rainy Day. And when The Rainy Day, um, as one of his poems, became quite well known, um, I think his sister wanted to have the desk there. So she actually loaned it from Ian and then it returned to the home. So there's that desk, but there's also another interesting desk that belonged to Stephen Longfellow, um, the grandfather. And that desk sits up in the uh, second floor, okay? And that's an armchair desk. And that's, that's a really interesting story uh, from what we understand that Henry loved going to visit his grandparents, not only in Hiram, but in Gorham. Mm -hmm. And the children remember that uh, the judge and also a lawyer, Stephen Longfellow, would work at that um, desk. And when he would get up and take a break, the children would sometime go and they would, they would basically imitate him, okay? And as he saw that, he decided he would send the desk down to the Portland home for the children to use. You know, the Ray, you mentioned a famous poem, The Rainy Day has that line, that wonderful, and to each life some rain. But we talk about Henry writing a poem. And people use phrases every day. I mean, we can, we, can, we can cite dozens of them. They don't even realize that they're quoting Longfellow, but there's that poem that he wrote, and he was, he was had suffering grief at that time. It was 1842. Now, he lost, he lost Mary in 1835. He met Fanny in August of 1836. He came back, started teaching at Harvard when he returned, and thus began it was six or seven years of really frustrated courtship to call a courtship as being generous. I mean, uh, whether he proposed to her outright, we don't know, but what she did do is reject him. They remained friends, but she wasn't overly interested. We don't really know wh what she, her plans were. He was a very skilled artist, a wonderful writer. He was a, 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 so the belle of Boston, I think easily the most, uh, uh, the most uh, sought after woman on Beacon Hill. Her father was uh, Nathan Appleton, the founder of Lowell, Massachusetts. And, but so there's a six or seven year courtship, which includes, and you had mentioned before we came on the program, that he wrote a good deal of Hyperion, which is a, a, a what he called a romance, but it's kind of a Romana clay. It's a, it's a novel that's loosely based on his own uh, failed attempts to win the hand of Fanny Appleton. And, uh, and I, I, I argue that that's the second dumbest thing he ever did in his life, uh, writing that novel and, and, and writing about Fanny Appleton, I mean, which was just definitely horrifying. The first, uh, my, my, my feeling is the worst decision he ever made was really insisting that his first wife, Mary, go to Europe with him. I don't really think she wanted to make that trip. Uh, Henry's father, Stephen, told him, he'd be, Henry's father didn't want him to take the Harvard job. He thought he was doing very well in Brunswick. It was a nice job. Mary was very happy there, but she was so supportive of his ambitions, she went. And she was a very weak and fragile woman. and. Uh, and it just didn't bode well for her. And, uh, and I think that not only did he grieve her loss, but I think he felt a, a degree of guilt. When you read that poem, Footsteps of Angels, he pays tribute to Pierce. The two, he, he lost his friend Pierce, who's a brother-in-law, but he also lost Mary. And he also writes that in the night too. You know, it's very interesting. Cross of Snow, many, many years later. It's also in the night. I think it was probably an insomniac, but he writes and she, and in that particular poem, Mary visits him in the night and she rests her gentle hand in his and, and it's just soft rebukes. There are soft rebukes. What are those rebukes all about? But it devastates him. And it's around this time that he's failing in his pursuit of Fanny Appleton and he's continuing to grieve the loss of Mary. 
And he has what I think can be argued as perhaps you know, approaching a nervous breakdown. He's very emotionally distraught. He does something he's never done in his life. He, he gets a leave of absence from Harvard to go to Europe for a water cure in Germany. He goes for six months and he bathes in the Rhine River and mud baths and all these other things. And he visits Charles Dickens and he comes home and he writes it. On the way home, he writes those seven poems on slavery, which are published as soon as he gets back. For people who say Henry really didn't was mute on the issue of slavery, I say, read his poems on slavery, 1842, seven poems. Really, I think one of the, the first American poets to really write uh, about the evils of slavery. And uh, in fact, I'm thinking of writing an essay about that for a, a little bit later because it's a very significant point. But he comes home, I think he's kind of manic depressive almost because he's down in the dumps and then he meets with Dickens and now he's very high and he comes high and happy and he comes back. There's a, there's a party at, at a home in Cambridge and he and Fanny patch up their differences and he says on the day that she accepts his proposal of marriage, oh day forever blessed that ushered in this vita nuova of happiness. And he does that every year, he, on May 10th, every year thereafter, he puts pretty much the same line and it does. He thought he would never have the happiness that he had lost with Mary again. And here it was, it was a vita nuova of happiness. And uh, this is all, but this is 1842 and he's writing this novel up in Maine on that desk. So I didn't realize that he, until you told me that he had actually worked on that up there. And I think you've got documentation for that in the house. Is that right? I thought he'd been working on this and I'm sure he did because he did it over a period of time, a period of months, about six months writing that period. But I didn't realize that he had done a good bit of it up there uh, in Maine on that desk. And it makes perfect sense now that you pointed out to me. I'm going to turn it over to you at that point. So, so follow so, gentlemen, I wonder if you might be ready to take a few questions yeah, from sure. the audience. Sure. sure. So actually, first is a comment um, from Jane, uh, who says that she just finished the book and she really loved it. Uh, she used to be a park ranger uh, at Longfellow House in Cambridge. Um, and she actually used to work with folks there who had known uh, Henry, uh, Harry Dana, one of uh, Henry's um, grandchildren, and uh, that they could, that those, those folks used to work with could tell um, amazing stories, and she helped write the interpretive plan at the house, uh, so she is a fan of your book um, and is joining us this evening. So one of the questions we have um, from Kim, did Henry find another love later in his life? You mean, you mean after Fanny? After Fanny. Um, I don't think so. There's some speculation. There are some letters. Uh, there are two young women that, there was one young woman who worked with him in the house. Um, but I don't, the short answer is no. I mean, I don't think so. He may have had some aspirations. He, he, he loved women. I mean, I, I mean, in a very, I mean that in a very good, decent, and wholehearted way. He loved women and he had wonderful relationships, intellectual relationships with women. He's always expressing how beautiful a certain a woman might be. And so there's that. And he was a young man. So I, I, but uh, if he had any relationship, it was then Seb Rosa that we don't really know about. I mean, there are some speculations based on a half a dozen letters that are very uh, vague. And uh, I don't write about them in the book because I don't think there's enough there to sustain it, number one. And number two, the story is really about Henry and Fanny. It's the Cross of Snow uh, is really a, a dual narrative and their life together. And I, I regard the 22 years after her death, almost even anticlimactic, even though it was his years of greatest, greatest, greater popularity. The short answer is, I don't think so, but, but, but uh, don't hold me to it unless something comes up that hasn't come up in the last 150 years or so. Sure. Uh, this question is from Mary. Um, have either of you ever come across anything about Henry's cousin, George Wadsworth, who was a civil engineer who built railroads in the South during the Civil War? No. My short answer to that one is no. No. John, how about you? No, I haven't. <laughs> Not familiar with that cousin. So that, that'll remain a bit of a mystery. Um, let's see. See, uh, Thomas says, uh, just beginning to read your book um, and wondering um, what were Walt Whitman's opinions of uh, Henry Longfellow? Um, he was gracious. I mean, Henry, when Henry died, he wrote a 
you can find his, his statement. Do a, do a Google of Whitman, Longfellow, and the, the full text of it will come up. He, he was kind of complimentary. I, I think he recognized that Henry was writing in a different kind of poetry that he was, he was doing. Uh, uh, they really didn't know each other. They may have met once, uh, but there was nothing significant as far as I can see. I, I don't see Henry ever writing, talking about his work. Uh, so I, but what, how, what Whitman felt about Longfellow, whatever he expressed privately, I don't know. He, he was equivocal in, in his written comments and you can find it very easily in a, in a, in a Google search. I don't write about it in the book. Um, do we know uh, who sculpted the bust of Longfellow that's in Westminster Abbey? Do we know who the artist is? We do, but I don't have the name on the tip of my tongue. Again, it's in the book. Uh, and it's also, there's a, there's a replica of that in the Longfellow House in Cambridge. So that's a replica of that. And we have a replica of it here too in our, in our research library. Yeah, but we know, and again, it's, you can find it through a fast Google or look in the book. Beckwith comes to mind, but uh, don't hold me to that. You know, but sure. If you do, you do know what that is. And you can find it easily. It's not just like, give me something just go on her own, you can find it. We might be able to find the answer before, before we finish here tonight. Um, Kathleen asks, did Henry walk from Congress Street to Portland Headlight so that he might be inspired to write? John, that you, you probably can answer that one better. Yes, he used to, he used to love to walk out to Portland Headlight. He used to spend a lot of time in what is now called Delano Park. He used to go and write out, out there. Um, he had some favorite spots under some trees in what is called Delano Park. So right out by the headlock. A couple more questions. Um, can you, Susan asks, can you tell us more um, about your process of discovery to describe um, how Fanny died? Well, uh, there were only two witnesses to the accident. Young daughters, ages five and seven, and uh, she of course didn't survive through the morning. So uh, Henry was in the next room when this catastrophe uh, took place. So there's some speculation. I mean, she was clearly. Uh, we talk about objects, material objects, which the house in uh, Portland is filled with, and the house in Cambridge is filled with. And I talk about these documents, but one uh, one batch of material objects that also made me sit back and pause. There are five little tiny envelopes, little tiny envelopes. And in Fanny's handwriting, very clear, distinctive handwriting, written on each one, Edith's hair, July 1861. In four of the five, it was specific. Going to Edith's disposal there on the day of poem, the children's hour. It was, uh, it was a very hot July day. And, she was doing something with Edie's hair and she was clipping some lockets as they did. And she apparently had a candle and lit a candle. And what happened? Was there a, was a burst of uh, wind from an open window or did she reach her hand? Uh, they, they had very flammable dresses, these crinoline dresses. But what did, what definitely did happen is that her dress burst into flames and she was ablaze in an instant. She ran shrieking to the study where Henry was taking an afternoon doze. He did what he could. He used a rug, but he didn't survive the night. She survived the night, but passed away the following morning. So, so uh, again, the, the two eyewitnesses to that were the little girls. What was pieced together? There are some letters. So there's a letter from uh, Henry Lewis Conway Felton, who, the, who wrote to Sumner, who came. He was the president of Harvard and a good friend of Henry's. He showed up within, you know, within the uh, within as soon as he heard the news, and he kind of directed things on the scene. Another one, Motley wrote some letters to his wife, which are also very good, putting together the facts. So those letters primarily that were written in the immediate aftermath, which kind of reconstructed, especially letters from Felton to Sumner, they really give you all the factual detail you need to know. So was it the fact, was it her leaning over a candle or was it the candle slipping or maybe one of the children knocked it over or was it a burst of, what, who knew, who knows? And really what does it matter? It was a horrific accident. But it was a, it was a fire. It was a domestic accident. That was very common at the time. I write about that. Uh, as horrific as it was, 
we didn't have these fiery tidant fabrics and these women wear these horrible crinoline dresses they look like you know bells and uh, and i write about the the campaign in great britain and uh in the united states to either ban these things or please use fire retardant fabrics women were dying at a very re regular rate uh, because of these domestic fires and i document a good number of them in there uh, so uh, just three months after fanny's accident there was a play in philadelphia there, there were some ballerinas it was a, a staging a balletic uh, staging of the tempest and, and one of the dancers dresses caught fire and six women died that night and there was a panic in the theater uh, it was written up uh, in harper's magazine they did a, a drawing of it uh, engraving of this scene it was a very very common thing she was probably the most uh, well-known victim of such a catastrophe but, but it was not that, that that unusual an event so really i worked with the documents worked with whatever was available and letters and reconstructed henry didn't write anything about it in his journal he was devastated uh, so then he was really, he really suppressed so much of it. He really never talked about it much, but he suppressed, as, I, as he said once, to the outside world, I project calm in, inwardly, I'm bleeding to death. And because he had those children that he had to take care of. So I'll, I, that's a long answer, but basically going through the documents, relying on letters from people who came within hours of the event and reported to their friends. Wayne is wondering um, if you could say more about Henry's thoughts and his writings about African Americans, including during his time in Portland. Well, Portland, I can't answer to. I mean, I don't think there's much in the record actually to document that. I've been through his journals, his letters. <clears throat> but we do know, I mean, again, he wrote those poems on slavery. His closest friend in the world was Charles Sumner, who was the great, you know, the great abolitionist. Sumner was beaten to within inches of his life on the Senate floor for the crime against Kansas. So uh, Henry wrote those seven poems where people will wonder why he didn't do more in the way of his poetry. But he, he wrote poems, he wrote in other ways. I mean, he wrote for the preservation of the Union. Paul Revere's right, right is a clear cry to, to preserve the Union. There's no question about that. The building of the ship, he writes, oh, he wrote, ship of state, sail on, oh, ship of state, sail on, oh, Union strong and great, you know, this is all about the preservation of the Union. Uh, when it comes to actual intera interactions with African Americans, he went and visited with the escaped slave, Ellen uh, Kraft, she was a very, very fascinating story about, she was a woman who, her complexion made it such that she was able to pass for being white, and she escaped from Georgia, I think it is, with her husband who, who masqueraded as her manservant, and they came up north and they found sanctuary in Boston, and Henry went to visit her and uh, with Frederica Brema, this uh, Swedish writer who was touring and so they met with her and he was very impressed by, by his meeting with her. Uh, he gave his, his account books are, are replete with, uh, he gave money, many, 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 many uh, uh, contributions and it will be for Negro slaves or for escaped slaves. So I think he gave financial support to the Underground Railroad. So he, his, and, and when the 54th, 55th Regiment marches south in the Civil War, he goes into Boston to watch them. He writes, he writes, he was so proud of watching his black regiment march down Beacon Street to go off and fight uh, in the Civil War. So uh, you, you won't find much of it in his, in his poetry, but, but if you really want to see what he wrote about in his poetry, I say do a Google, Poems on Slavery, Longfellow, you can get a full text. Uh, seven poems published in 1842. And, and I, you know, people thought it was weak and tepid, but I say read them. Uh, he talks about his one poem, We Are the Witnesses, and he talks about a sunken ship, a slave ship, and there were skeletons shackled in there, We Are the Witnesses. And he write another poem is about an escaped slave on the run, and he's hiding in the bushes, and he can hear the baying of the hounds, and he's got these scars on his back. This is tough stuff, as far as I'm concerned. And when uh, uh, a Philadelphia publisher brought out a, an edition of his collected works. They refused to, to include those poems in the, in the edition. So I think Henry, I think Henry's position on, on slavery and, and his, his feeling for African Americans is, is strong and, and documentable. Catherine asks, what were Henry's siblings' professions? Oh. Well, uh, <clears throat> 
John, you can, you can kick in here too, but what, his brother Alex was a civil engineer. He's often called the forgotten Longfellow, I mean, but there's a book written about him with that title. The youngest member of the family, uh, <clears throat> Sam, was a Unitarian minister. And his first biographer lived with him for a while. He wrote the first biography of Henry. He was a minister. Uh, the, the, the sisters were, I mean, they were either housewives or they, they weren't employed per se. Uh, if you could, maybe you can help out, John, with us. No, no, Nick, you pretty much covered it. I think we could we could say uh, Anne, you know, she was something of a preservationist too, you know, who had the foresight to see uh, their childhood home, you know, preserved and turned into a museum upon her death. I don't think that's that's not a job she got paid for, um, but uh, we might we might say that was you know that was a, a profession of hers, certainly a calling of hers towards the end of her life. And let's think about that gesture too, because this comes along at a time when people really weren't thinking about preserving authentic colonial era, post-colonial era houses and um, residences in their in their original fashion. I mean. Uh, and the Longfellows in Cambridge were the same with Craigie House when they bought Craigie House, which later became the uh, Longfellow House. They were determined to keep it because General George Washington lived there for nine months during the siege of Boston. So they felt a very, uh, a very great responsibility to preserve it in much the way, as close, close as they could make it to what it was like when Washington was there. I mean, they, they made it comfortable for themselves, but the point is they had a, they had a commitment to preservation. And I think that was kind of novel for that particular time in the 19th century. And sister, I think, did the exact same thing with the home in Maine. I mean, isn't it the first uh, historic site in the state of Maine, John? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, long for the Wadsworth House. Yeah, the historic home, yes. Yeah. Very so, so Anne, the thing, of, the thing about Anne is, is she wanted to preserve the home not only um, to, to save it, because of the wonderful childhood they had. But this all stems back to, I believe that after, after George Washington Pierce died, Anne returned to the home. And as the city was growing uh, around the property, the, the, city, the city came to Anne and they offered Anne $25,000 for the home, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and of course, Anne refused. Um, and I, I think that was the start of it back then. I think that, that once she saw, they wanted to tear the house down and build a tenement home. Mm -hmm. That was the plan. $25,000 was a lot of money back then um, for that house. But I really believe um, wholeheartedly that that started the whole preservation movement for Anne to, to make sure that that house was never touched. I think the point is, I think we can credit her for that. And you say, what did she do? That's something that she did quite meaningfully, and I think quite demonstrably, that she was active in this preservation movement. And that is the first house built in Portland entirely of brick, I think, too, right? Mm -hmm. Really, because the brick wasn't being, I mean, they didn't have stones up there. They shipped all that brick up from Philadelphia to Philly to build that house. Right, right. It took two years to build because they ran out of brick. <laughs> I didn't know they They had to send for more. I didn't know that. That's a wonderful detail. It's a wonderful, and it was well built, very thick walls too. They, they, they were able to put on that third floor when, when uh, Zilpah and her husband moved in. And Peely moved out and moved to Hiram and they turned over the house to Zilpah. So the front, the back walls and the two side walls are basically the load bearing walls of the house. And they are six brick deep. Wow. That's amazing. So I think we have time for just a, a couple more questions. Um, uh, Judy asks, can you comment on Longfellow's control of his own copyrights? Yeah, well, copyrights are uh, interesting, you know, and there were certainly problems. One of the reasons D Dickens came to lecture in the United States was because there were piracies in his work. You really couldn't uh, control your copyrights in foreign lang languages. So he came and he did these, these wonderful readings and he made money on that. But Longfellow was, it was, it was extraordinary with controlling his, uh, his intellectual property. I mean, with his copyrights and his intellectual property, uh, he kept the stereo the plates. It was very astute. So the plates that were made to print his books, they would, might break down the type, but they'd make a plate. And he kept them. They were his property. And when they went into later printings, so he made money not only uh, from shipping in fields as his, as his royalty for each book, but he, 
basically rented out his, his plate. And he was very, very uh, uh, hands-on when it came to putting out a variety of editions. He wanted to have inexpensive, cheap editions so more people could read them, but he also loved doing uh, beautiful, expensive, beautifully produced, nice paper, beautiful binding. So he was very hands-on with his, I, I think he's, he's, been the, he's been the subject of numerous monographs uh, of his control of his intellectual property and just how astute he was. He was a good manager and he, he cut good deals for his, when he gave the Mokotari Sayu Thomas, he came back to Bowdoin, by the way, I haven't mentioned that. 50th anniversary of his class. He, after he retired teaching from Harvard, he never wanted to speak in public again. For the most part, he didn't, but he was persuaded to come and give his 50th anniversary oration on the, on the occasion of his 50th anniversary. And he composed this poem, the Moratori Sayutamas, which translates those of us, those who are we who are about to die, salute you, was from the Roman gladiators. And he gave us, I, in fact, I begin the book with him. He, came, he comes up and why did he finally decide to come and speak and come back to the Buenos Aires? Well, I, oh, I discussed that in the book. But that very same day, it was published in the Harper's Weekly and the New York Times. And I don't recall the exact figure, but $3,000 pops into my mind. I mean, he negotiated very good terms, not only for the, uh, to have the thing published, but good terms to be compensated for it. But he was very astute, very careful. Uh, and he, he, his notebooks, he kept notebooks. He, he writes in uh, 25 editions of Hiawatha, how many copies and what, what, what his royalties were. He, he pretty much knew how much he earned on every, everything that he wrote, how many copies were purchased. He was a very astute manager of his intellectual property, I think is the best answer to that question. Carla asks, what was the most interesting aspect of Henry that you discovered? His decency. He was, he was revered as this, as this poet of the people and a, and a man who truly loved his wives, loved his children, loyal to his friends. And uh, it is impossible to find anyone who ever met him who's not impressed by him and doesn't like him genuinely. I, I, I think I knew that going into that, going into the research, but, uh, and I don't want to even call it a surprise how heartened I was to find it, to find it, uh, Born out every every turn I take when people write him letters and people uh, write about him to other people, uh, or they they give their own recollections of having met him. Uh, you have a young man who was a, working in Tickerman Fields. He was just a uh, an entry level clerk, and he later became became one of the editors. And he remembered all these various writers coming in. It could have been Emerson or this one or that one. But when Longfellow came in, he said it was a cause for celebration. He knew everyone by name. And, and when and everyone said when you talked when you spoke to Longfellow, he looked you straight in the eyes, and you were the only person in the room who paid attention to everything he said. So I guess his just his utter decency as a human being uh, inspired me, and 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 this this remarkable love story between himself and Fanny to me was uh, really the overriding joy of doing this book. I hated to see it end, to be truthful with you. So one last question for you both. I, I saved this one because I thought it would be a good one to end on. Uh, Jane asks, what would be the most important thing that a person could come to understand about Henry that you could only understand by visiting the home here in Portland and the home in Cambridge? So in other words, what does an immersion in those surroundings do for us that no book, photo, or video could ever do? I'll, I'll start. Every time I walked into that house, because I, <clears throat> I spent a good seven or eight years at going to Longfellow House in Cambridge. And I think they wondered what I was doing there after point day after day, week after week. Every time I walked in that house, you know, you don't want to be melodramatic about it, but people, very important people, walked to these floors and sat at these tables and appreciated these paintings. I mean, the cutlery, cutlery is there. And he kept his pencil stubs. Uh, he kept the 25 pencil stubs. This one was, I finished Evangeline with. This one is that. You really do feel the immediacy of these people. And it's not just Henry and his circle. It's George Washington, uh, who was there also during the siege of Boston. It's a remarkable step back in time. And everything is authentic. And the same thing in the house in Maine, where John works. It's authentic, and you really feel. And it's, it's they're really two together, because you get his youth growing up there. And you see the scrawlings on the windows, the graffiti. We didn't mention the graffiti that they did in the 
upstairs on the third floor. It was amazing. You know, uh, Charlie Longfellow, his son did the same thing. He got his initiate, scrawled his initials in one of the windows in Cambridge, and it's, it's still there. That, that hasn't changed. So I, I guess just this feeling of walking back into the 19th century. And I have to say, I just came to love the 19th century, not only because it was a different time, but because they documented themselves so magnificently. I'm a writer who likes to hear the voices of the people I'm talking about, I'm interviewing them, because they wrote such beautiful letters. And Fanny Longfellow wrote letters that every bit as good as Henry Sebsey, maybe perhaps even better. She kept beautiful journals, Henry did the same. So you can actually have them speak in their own voices. And that to me was such a treat uh, that it's going to be very hard for me to read the 19th century and, and another book. How about you, John? What do you feel when you walk into these places? Well, I just really think about the beautiful childhood that the kids had there and how much they loved that house, how much they loved their parents. Um, and it was just, a, it was a, their life there in the house in Portland was a joy. It just was. And I mean, it inspired Henry to write. And we really don't know how many works that Henry actually worked on in the Portland home. He visited, he worked, you know, he was in Nahant, he was also in Cambridge. But you know what I mean? The, the, the frequent visits that he would make in the summertime, you know, at least once a year to the home over the, the long span of years, um, we can't really say. I say to people, I know certain ones that he wrote here, I know certain things that he worked on, but you know, it's, it's, the house in Portland's kind of a mystery because we really don't know all the works that he worked on. Well, that's a very good point because even though he wrote very, very extensive journals, the one thing that they don't give you, unfortunately, is deep insight into the creative process. He'll tell you he's working on this, or I started the building of the ship, and he'll tell you a week later he finished it. It's maddening, you know, I mean, where'd you get the idea for this? You have to put things together. And I think you find that. That's why when you told me he was working on Hyperion up there, I said, okay, makes sense. But I didn't know that. And he certainly doesn't say that in the journal. So you have to put that together. You got that, I think, from uh, some of the other writings. Which were right. Well, it, it was his sister, Ian, who said, under this lamp, which the, is the lamp hanging in the summer dining room that was over the, the desk that he wrote a rainy day on, she said, this is the lamp that he wrote, wrote Hyperion under. Henry also says that he finished Evangeline while he was um, here in, in Portland, so. Really? Okay. Well, thank you both so much. This has been uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you for everyone who could join us this evening and for those, for those great questions and for sharing your, your great stories and uh, insights with us. Um, make sure to visit uh, mainhistory.org where you can uh, learn more about, you can see the recording of this program and you can learn more about our upcoming programs. Uh, you can purchase Nick's uh, book through our museum store. And also I'll say um, you can see more of Nick's uh, upcoming programs and work at his website, nicholasbassbaines.com. Uh, presently, uh, to keep everyone safe, our, our staff, our guests, and our collections, the Wadsworth Longfellow House uh, in, in Portland is, is closed. But you can learn more about the house Henry's time there, his family, uh, also uh, find a database of all of his published poems. If you visit our website, hwlongfellow.org, you can see images of the house. Um, you can even download an app to your phone uh, to listen to an audio tour of the house. So until we're able to welcome you all to the house in person, you can experience uh, some of Henry's life and his work online. And uh, do either of you gentlemen uh, have anything, uh, final thoughts you'd like to share with us before we close the program this evening? I want to congratulate Nick on a great book. It's really, really your research. It's incredible. Thank you so much, Nick. I will recommend it to all the guides and docents that work here at the Longfellow House. Yes, thank you. And I recommend your book to everyone because as I said earlier, it was, a, it was an essential source for me in the writing of my own book. So thank you for, for your work on Longfellow. Great to see you again. Say hello to your wife for me, Dad. Thank you. You said your best. Take care. You're such a wonderful model. It was true. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you. And uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, again for joining us. And I hope that we'll see you all back here for another uh, virtual program with Maine Historical Society soon.